y'all. How's it going? Welcome to the show. It's the Scott Horton Show. I'm him. Thanks for tuning in. Should be a good one. I got uh, Jason Leopold on the show. Just back from Guantanamo Bay. Luckily, he was free to leave this time, you know. I guess we'll see how that works out for him in the long term. Anyway, uh, Jason Leopold uh, got some journalism for Al Jazeera about his time down there journalisting at Guantanamo Bay. And then Daniel Ellsberg's going to be on the show to talk about the American hero, Bradley Manning, and the American government's persecution of him. And then, of course, I want to talk to him about Snowden. And it's funny because I didn't start taking notes on the Ellsberg interview until about 10 seconds before the show started. And I can't remember what was the other stuff I wanted to ask Dan Ellsberg about. I had a whole, like, uh, four or five fingers that I had ticked off the other day of things that I wanted to ask Dan Oh, you know what, though? I got a friend in my email box who's got some questions for Dan. I'm just going to refer to what she was wondering. Maybe that will help to jog my memory. Hmm. All right, so it's the show. I'm Scott Horton, scotthorton.org. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at slash Scott Horton Show. Uh, interview archives are at scotthorton.org more than 2800 of them now going back to 2003 Uh, on my YouTube channel there's a relatively new edition there a speech I gave at San Angelo uh, Angelo State University in San Angelo, Texas back uh, at the end of April thanks very much to the Young Americans for Liberty for having me out and it's too factual and boring I need to mix more shtick in But basically, it's my rap on North Korea, well, America's policy toward North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Mali, and some on the neocon support for the Chechen jihadists. So, if you like me and you like videos of stuff on YouTube, well, there's a video of me on YouTube talking about a bunch of things. And you got to admit, hardly anybody's good on North Korea, right? You got your Doug Bandow, and you got your John Pfeffer, and then your, um, hmm, and Gordon Prather, but he's retired. Who else is good on America's horrible North Korea policy? Hardly anybody, right? I can't think of any more people. And I must actually even know of some I don't know. I've got very few expert guests on North Korea. But then again, that might just be because of my ignorance. But anyway, uh, of experts who agree with me, not my ignorance of the subject, you can see for yourself right there, youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. There I am making mincemeat out of George Bush and Barack Obama's North Korea policy. There you go. Hate to stick up for Bill Clinton in any way. But all things being equal, his North Korea policy was far superior to what's come since. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's a speech of me. Uh, Today's the 20th of June here. I'm taking notes on my notes. Um, Yeah, see... I got a lot of news to cover, too. Mm. That's kind of anyway. All right. Uh, you know, I, had, I didn't even get a chance to look at antiwar.com today. Well, here's from yesterday. I think this is the same headline again because it's a late headline from yesterday, right? No, nope, here's the new version. Are U.S. Taliban talks dead before they start? Well, I saw one government spokesperson type on TV saying that the uh, the Taliban had broken the agreement by showing up to the talks in Qatar 
and calling their office the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, as though they were still the state there. And this terribly offended Hamid Karzai, who pulled out of the talks. But then the Taliban guys said, oh, you know what? You're right. We forgot that that was uh, part of the deal was we were supposed to wait to call ourselves that until a little bit later after we have finished sacking Kabul again. Okay, good. And so they dropped that. So maybe now the talks can continue. Boy, those Democrats, I don't know how they think they're going to get away with really making a deal with the Taliban. I saw Barbara Starr on CNN yesterday, and she's known, I mean, she's their Pentagon correspondent, but she's known as just simply a, a mouthpiece for the Pentagon. She doesn't have the intelligence to report a real story. All she just reports is what they say. Pentagon officials say this. Pentagon officials say that. That's all she can do as far as journalism goes. And so what she was saying yesterday was, well, maybe, and she's just channeling the generals that she's talking to or the colonels or whoever. Well, maybe we can get the Taliban to settle for just one village or two. Or maybe, like, you know, if they got, um, you know, uh, an area. Mm, like part of a region, a province or, or something. And we could get them to just go ahead and go with that. And then it'll be fine. So, first of all, I don't know how the Democrats think that politically they can negotiate with the Taliban for a single village for anything. Aren't the Republicans going to tear them to shreds for that? And secondly, uh, I don't know how they think that they're going to be able to negotiate anything with the Taliban who... After all, we're on the eve of total victory when America intervened in 2001. And assuming the Americans aren't there anymore, then it'll just be a matter of time before they finish defeating the Communist Northern Alliance again, you know? Uh, I know, they say Massoud was the leader of the Mujahideen war against the Soviets, but nope. Eric Margulies said he was KGB. The Pashtun Mujahideen, they were the real fighters against the Soviets. Them and their Arab friends. From Abdul Azam's group. The Saudis and the Egyptians and others. But the uh, Hazaras and Uzbeks and Tajiks and whatever that we call the Northern Alliance now. Masood's men. Uh, they were all one level of traitor or another. Whether they knew it or not, right? He was the boss, and he was a traitor to the Afghans. He was KGB all along. Anyway, uh, and then, you know, it's his guys in alliance with people who were outright loyal to the Soviet Union back then. Um, but anyway, so uh, at some point, assuming the Americans ever leave... Uh, the Taliban are going to take the whole country because they're not going to settle for less than that because they don't have to. So why would they? But then the Americans have this ridiculous schizophrenic policy on Afghanistan. We talked about this with Con Hallinan on the show a couple of weeks ago. He made a lot of sense saying that, uh, hey, look, the plan was to whoop the Taliban from here to Sunday so that they would come bloody on their knees begging to negotiate with us in July of 2011. But that never happened. The surge just helped them grow more powerful in response to it. Permanent as they are and temporary as it was. Didn't help anything. So now here we are two years after the the uh, successful results of the counterinsurgency strategy were supposed to kick in. And now they're coming, if not on their knees, although maybe, at least with their hat in hand, to the Taliban. And are basically saying, how can we work together so that you guys can take the country and we can save a little bit of face on the way out the door, right? Just like Richard Nixon. Look, communist North Vietnamese government, I know that you're going to conquer the South and everything, but can you at least give us a little while 
after we withdraw so the American people can forget about it a little bit and I don't look quite as bad. Right? That's what to negotiate. Please don't put all my Quislings heads on pikes until I've been gone for like, you know, six months. That way the American people will have forgotten all about it. That kind of thing. Anyway, I just thought it was hilarious watching Barbara Star going, yeah, and so, you know, my military sources are saying, well, geez, maybe we can get the Taliban to be re- uh, terribly reasonable and go along with us and help us make uh, help make us look good as we hand them their total victory they've won, while at the same time planning, oh, yeah, we, and we're going to stay forever, too. Oh, they can't conquer the whole country because we got to keep the Americans there. For uh, oh, I see why all my signals are hot today. I, I had a slider up. Anyway, uh, yeah, they blew it. What a disaster! And you know the Taliban—they're horrible. And as far as governments go, you know they never were really powerful enough to be totalitarian in their activities, but they sure were in their goals. You know, they sure. Uh, they sure had a system of micromanaging everything and with the severest of uh, medieval punishments and whatever, you know? Throw your sister down a well because she smiled in public or whatever kind of madness. But then again, the Americans' police forces there in Afghanistan are just roving gangs of child rapists. And the Taliban put the sword to people like that. Now, if you were the average Afghan citizen and you don't really have a dog in the fight between, you know, uh, you know, you're not directly on the side of any of the competing security forces <laughs> trying to be your monopoly state, which one would you prefer? You know, I don't I think it's easy to at least understand why the at least the Pashtuns of Afghanistan, who had no other real political representation anyway, uh, why they were willing to settle for the Taliban back in the mid-90s. The Taliban came and said, all right, who all are the child rapists in this town? Blam, and off with your head. And, yeah, I mean, they're, they were authoritarians, and they were would-be totalitarians, you know? They just didn't have the, the, uh, the resources to really be totalitarians. But they're some pretty backwards-ass medieval... Look, you know who they are, the Taliban. They're the Afghan refugees from the American-Soviet proxy war in Afghanistan in the 1980s who fled to Pakistan and were all orphans and, uh, you know, raised up in these radical Saudi finance mosques. So they're, you know, a bunch of... uh, that was their origins. It's a bunch of um, a bunch of desperate people raised in a very desperate time, with really nothing to cling on to but backwards ass radicalism and ultimate truth in the place of any real truth, you know. But anyway, so but they're murderers. And they're horrible. I mean, they're they're criminals. The stuff that they did to their own people, and I don't mean just the child molesters, but uh, the others. Uh, the things that they did to, to the people of Afghanistan, um, they certainly, you know, they earned a lot of the distaste. Never mind the fact that they were piling around with Osama and them. But just, you know, there was plenty of reason for people to hate them for how horrible they were. And I don't know how in the world, I mean, in, what I'm trying to get to is there's like 101 anecdotes in the way of Obama making a deal with these guys. How can he make an, a, a deal with these guys? Mullah Omar, he's the same one who did this, that, and the other horrible thing. Are you kidding? On the other side of that, I think everyone who cares about it knows that America can't win there. Only liars from the American Enterprise Institute or whatever just get paid by arms manufacturers to lie about the someday benefits of these policies 
would argue otherwise. They tried the surge under Mr. Special Forces McChrystal and then under his even better master of the counterinsurgency strategy, the sainted heavenly leader. The most wonderful man ever to have existed. General David Petraeus. And they failed. Ultimately and completely and totally to win that war. And so who else you got? What else you got? You can't win. You already lost. It's 2013. The war's over. It's the future now. That was the past. It's already just a matter of hanging on till... The, you know, uh, enough face has been saved. So it's just the right moment to slink out the door. Have Rachel Maddow do her little ticker tape parade on MSNBC. Hooray, it's over. We won. The Democrats. So it's not like they have any choice. But the Taliban, they hold all the cards here. Hey, guess what? We're from here. You're not. Guess what? You're bankrupt. So are we, but we don't need money. (laughs) And you do. (laughs) So, anyway. I don't even know. They must have all been snickering to themselves, talking about, okay, let's, let's drop the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan for a moment. And just call ourselves the people who are going to be the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan again in just a little while. And the Americans are very optimistic now. Oh, we think that we can really make something out of these Afghan talks. It's too bad that uh, Karzai's, um, you know, having a fit, but we'll just have to... We'll just have to work it out. But we're really looking forward to sitting down with the Taliban. Wouldn't that be funny if uh, if Barack Obama just outright went ahead like he tried to do in 09 and just get rid of Karzai, but only this time, instead of trying to put Abdullah Abdullah in there, just go ahead and put Mullah Omar back in power in Kabul? Pretend this whole thing never happened? Wouldn't that be nice? Anyway. Um. Oh, you know what? I am no good at thinking of things when I should be thinking of them. Hang on, dang it, I'm typing something. Not very well either. All right. So, uh, yeah. I got a bunch of news to cover here. Uh, I never did uh, try to get Bob Dreyfus on the show. I really need to do that, though, because I want to talk with him about Syria. He's a good guy. Um... Now, you don't even need to know this, really. I mean, uh, the headline at antiwar.com, you already know. The headline's all you need. Syria Islamists seize control. On that side, anyway. As moderates dither. Really? You mean moderates aren't the first ones to line up to go and get killed? That would be the extremists, huh? The true believers over there. Uh, I'm sorry. Again, I have to go break off onto the tangent of I just can't believe the double think in American political society or whatever the hell on TV and in Washington, D.C., and what these jerks at the think tanks write back and forth to each other. And, you know, in their tweets, too. They just ignore entirely who are the so-called Syrian rebels. 
well, we just have to back them because the government is serious bad and we got to stop them and they're killing people and they got to be stopped. And once we intervene, that's when all the killing will stop. That's when the violence will tam- will be tamped down, right? Once America arrives, then the war will be over. Now, they never have to explain how that makes any sense at all. And they never have to explain, well, how in the hell is the CIA supposed to tell which of these Islamist insurgents is a moderate and which one is an extremist? Other than the moderates are the ones who've been living in Virginia and or in France. They're hardly Syrians at all. They're big and they're fat and they're expatriates and they're Western intelligence sock puppets and they have no will of their own and they have no people. But, oh well, you know what? Let's go on like this for another two years of our government backing the suicide bomber, prisoner beheader, Mujahideen warriors from around the region, all while just pretending everybody doesn't know that's exactly what they're doing. And just holding discussions about, yeah, backing the rebels, the rebels, the rebels, and never, ever, ever having to be more specific than that. Occasionally, well, you know, we've got to back the moderates and not the extremists among the rebels. It's actually unreal to me. It's unbelievable to me. I was on, uh, I was on Alan Butler's show, and he goes, yeah, but how does John McCain justify backing Al-Qaeda? That's the part I don't understand. And I go, well, because he doesn't call it that. He says, we got to back the moderates so as to marginalize the Al-Qaeda guys. Al-Qaeda broadly defined as Sunni, Islamist, uh, suicide bomber, revolutionary types who've openly declared their loyalty to Ayman al-Zawahiri, for example. Want to be Al-Qaeda, maybe, but bad enough. Well, McCain keeps saying, well, you know, we just need to back the good rebels, not the bad ones. And then he posed with the Northern Storm Brigades. And those were the guys who were the kidnappers. And I know people try to dispute about the one kidnapper in the picture or not. It doesn't matter. It's the same group. Uh, You know, I don't know how they think they can try to differentiate at all. The Northern Storm Brigade, who kidnapped the Shiite pilgrims and still hold nine out of 11 of them for ransom... The Northern Storm Brigades, who had already been interviewed by Time Magazine, telling the camera, yeah, one of them at least, saying, yeah, that's right, I'm a veteran of the Iraq War. Yeah, where he fought on the side of the Sunni-based insurgency against the American and Iranian-backed Shiite majority parties. Those are the people John McCain went to meet. And that was the whole point of his photo op, was, see, there are good Syrian jihadist, rebel, suicide bomber, prisoner beheaders. We just have to, you know, differentiate. I'm sure there's a lot of CIA in Syria passing out guns, but if anyone believes that they actually know who they're passing out guns to, where all the guns are ending up, or that they really, you know, like Al CIA, duh, like all the know nothing, know it alls like to say, like they really control these suicide bomber kooks that they're arming and backing, or even know who they are, most of them. I don't think so. I don't think the CIA knows a damn thing about Syria, really, at all. Not since they fired Bob Bear. And in fact, I think probably. If he was there still, he would be saying, we should not be backing the the rebellion uh, whom the Muslim Brotherhood are the nicest, most conservative, moderate part as compared to the radical extremist suicide bomber types. But uh, anybody who says that uh, 
the CIA can pick and choose well who to arm in Syria so that they might be able to, I don't know, at least hold Aleppo, if not ever sack Damascus or whatever. Um, and that they can guarantee that it's not going to go, bl- uh, not going to blow back on American citizens because they know what they're doing. They just can't say that. It's just a lie. It'd be like you saying that. Oh, I can go to Syria and I can decide who should get the guns and who shouldn't. No, you can't, right? <laughs> right, neither can they. They don't know. I read one of these stories the other day where the Syrian uh, rebel, if you call him that, and I don't know if this guy was even a Syrian or not, but he says, well, you know, I, I really want some of the guns and money from the Americans, but how can I tell whether I'm a moderate or not? <laughs> I don't know. What's a moderate? Oh, someone who promises to do what the CIA says as long as they're handing him a crate full of weapons and explosives. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm a moderate. Uh, you know, yeah, I'll do whatever you say. Why not? <laughs> All right. Ready for some more Syria headlines? Here's McClatchy newspapers. And, and listen well to the next three here. From McClatchy. Chemical weapons experts still skeptical about U.S. claim that Syria used sarin. Okay, Uh, shorter McClatchy. It's a lie. It's a bogus bunch of crap. They're going to sit there and claim a casus belly on a disputed sarin conclusion. With a body count of 150 supposed victims. Barack Obama gets to say, my red line is sarin. And then he gets to cite a completely and totally disputed use of sarin gas by the Syrian government. As crossing that red line. Maybe it is the fluoride in the water. How is it that the American people are putting up with this? How can they do this? How can they do this? People who actually know things about sarin don't believe it, screams the headline. But no matter. And people are saying, you know what, I think the NSA scandal might be a distraction from Syria. No, no, no. I think that the Syria intervention is just a distraction from the NSA scandal. And I say, the devil runs the U.S. government, guys. It's all one big scandal. It's called the Constitutional Convention of 1787. The secret, smoky-roomed conspiracy against you and all of humanity. And then I like this, from the Washington Post and from McClatchy Newspapers, this has nothing to do with Sarin. Decision to arm Syrian rebels was reached weeks ago, U.S. officials say, by Karen DeYoung, who might as well work for Barack Obama. They're at the Washington Post, which might as well be a department of the U.S. government. Oh, the war in uh, Syria? Yeah, we decided to no longer pretend that we're just sending the weapons to the Saudis to send to the Syrians and that we're going to go ahead and directly arm them uh, back a few weeks ago, you know, because Hezbollah intervened. And uh, we were worried that the rebels could lose Aleppo. Which they control all of Aleppo? So we decided to escalate more. Which, of course, uh, is anybody asking in here? Yeah, but it, doesn't that mean that uh, Iran and Hezbollah and the other side is going to escalate more, too? And are you sure that that's going to work out for you in a way that you want, huh? Anybody ask them that? But anyway, oh, yeah, in other words, nothing to do with Saren. That was just the convenient, not very believable at all lie that we came up with for you. And here, groundwork for arming Syrian rebels began before Obama's announcement. That's Shira Frankel at McClatchy. Uh, Here's uh, lawmakers. This is Fox News. Oh, no, I got to go. State of our economy. Damn it. 
Uh, lawmakers want to know fly zone, but Pentagon objects. And this one is by Jeffrey Goldberg, so you shouldn't believe it. But it's possible that it's true. And it's about how John Kerry wanted no fly zone and Dempsey shouted him down and said, no way. That's at uh, Bloomberg.com. Because this summer they'll be running my articles about the wars in Libya, Syria, and Somalia and the future of freedom too. That's FFF.org slash subscribe for the future of freedom. And tell them Scott sent you. Over at APAC, the leaders of the Israel lobby in Washington, D.C., they're constantly proclaiming unrivaled influence on Capitol Hill. And they should be proud. The NRA and AARP's efforts make them look like puppy dogs in comparison to the campaigns of intimidation regularly run by the neoconservatives and Israel firsters against their political enemies. But the Israel lobby does not remain unopposed. At the Council for the National Interest, they put America first, insisting on an end to the empire's unjustified support for Israel's aggression against its neighbors. And those those whose land it occupies, and pushing back against the lobby's determined campaign in favor of U.S. attacks against Israel's enemies. CNI also does groundbreaking work on the trouble with evangelical Christian Zionism and neocon-engineered Islamophobia and drumming up support for this costly and counterproductive policy. Please help support the efforts of the Council for the National Interest to create a peaceful, pro-American foreign policy. Just go to councilforthenationalinterest.org and click Donate under About Us at the top of the page. And thanks. Hey, y'all. Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson is a successful former hedge fund manager whose site is unique on the web. Subscribers are allowed a window into Mike's very real main account and receive announcements and explanations for all his market moves. The Federal Reserve has been inflating the money supply to finance the bank bailouts and terror war overseas. So Mike's betting on commodities, mining stocks, European markets, and other hedges against our depreciating dollar. Play along on paper or with real money and then be your own judge of Mike's investment strategies. See what happens at WallStreetWindow.com. the show i'm scott horton this is my show scotthorton.org 11 to 1 texas time every day here scotthorton.org and every day but thursday at noagendastream.com find my full interview archives at scotthorton.org sign up for the podcast feed if you want sooner or later we're gonna get the whole show podcast feed fixed but i don't know Anyway, you can definitely get the uh, interviews all there at scotthorton.org. And you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at slash Scott Horton Show. And our first guest today is our good friend Jason Leopold, uh, author of News Junkie and uh, now uh, reporter for Al Jazeera.com. And I don't mean the fake Al Jazeera. They finally got that URL away from the fake Al Jazeera. <laughs> Al Jazeera.com, <laughs> Al Jazeera.net. Either way here. It's uh, the great Jason Leopold, and his latest is a Guantanamo tour. Much ado about nothing. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Jason? Hey, Scott. Great to be with you again. Uh, very good to have you here. Uh, listen, before we get into the Guantanamo stuff, is it okay if I ask you a little bit about what Michael Hastings here? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I um, it's been a little while since I interviewed him. Honestly, is because I I put down the book, The Operators, and I was embarrassed. That I never finished the book, so I never interviewed him about the book, and then I never interviewed him about anything after that either, because I'm stupid. And now he's dead, and so oh well. But anyway, yeah. I know that you and him were you know actual friends, and uh, so I was just hoping you could tell the people about him and and what you think and things like that. Sure. Well, you know he was. Um... For, for a guy who was 33 years old, he was just so. Uh, I, I'm not even sure I can, you know, generate the right words. I mean, because uh, you know, when I heard the news, uh, geez, what was it? Just a couple of days ago, it would uh, it really hit me hard. Um, he was an incredible reporter who, you know, everyone has been saying those who knew him, you know, very old school. I just found him to be just so incredibly passionate about. Uh, not just reporting, but about the truth. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had, uh, we started to speak last year regularly uh, after I had obtained some documents from the Department of Homeland Security uh, in which uh, these internal emails showed just how nuts the Department of Homeland Security went 
uh, over a, a report uh, that uh, that Michael Hastings wrote for Rolling Stone about the Occupy Wall Street movement. And, uh, you know, these emails were just hilarious because it said uh, the, uh, you know, the Department of Homeland Security officials were saying, we need to call up Michael Hastings and explain to him our mission. Uh, you know, they were talking about pressuring him uh, to, you know, correct his story, take down his story. I mean, they were they were basically trying to, uh, you know, say that his story was wrong. Uh, you know, so I, got, I was putting together a report. I got on the phone with him, and, you know, we just started talking about uh, various, uh, first of all, this story, you know, and, and, and he laughed and said, you know, he, you know, he actually tried to call the Department of Homeland Security for comment uh, when he was putting the story together, and they wouldn't comment. And, and uh, you know, we're just talking about you know, the Freedom of Information Act and, uh, you know, some of the stories he was working on and, and, and how I was going to, you know, really utilize the Freedom of Information Act to try to get, you know, some of that material. And, you know, he, he was like, go for it. But he was just... You know, he he was just an all around nice guy uh, in terms of a reporter, uh, and just really cared about the stories. Uh, really did not want to be, uh, you know, pigeonholed uh, in terms of uh, being identified as, you know, liberal, Democrat, libertarian, what what is whatever it is. He 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 was just a person who, um, you know, lived and breathed journalism, uh, and uh, it was uh, it. it 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 really was um, something that he was incredibly passionate about, and you know, somebody who was just thirty three years old uh, to have that kind of experience uh, and, and to be so authoritative in his work and writing, I just it was inspiring to me. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, he was uh, you know he was out here in L A. and uh, you know starting to uh, write about uh, you know the entertainment industry, as well as continuing to work uh, on, uh, you know, some political uh, issues. And, and, and some of his, you know, stories that he was uh, working on, um, you know, certainly involved, uh, uh, you know, the CIA. And, um, and, and and he wrote this incredible story last year about this, uh, you know, the, these abuses that took place at this hospital in Afghanistan. And that's actually what I spoke to him about. Um, recently was this Freedom of Information Act um, uh, request that I filed, you know, trying to um, grab all these documents from the Department of, of Defense. So, you know, I, I'm not sure that really completely answers your question. It's uh, it's it's just, for me, you know, just, uh, just hearing that news is just, wow. Um, it was truly a shock. Uh, um, you know, just, just really... Well, look, I, let me uh, let me tell you lot. this. From from my point of view, I mean, you know what I do. I, I don't do journalism like you guys, man. I sit here, but I, I'm kind of the clearinghouse. <laughs> I talk to all of you guys. Right. You know what I mean? And there's yeah. really very few. I think some of my listeners probably get bored and quit listening because it's the same guests over and over again because I'm pretty picky. And, and there's not too many journalists and or, you know, columnists, opinionists out there who, you know, have the attitude – to get the job done well, you know what I mean? To get the to get the correct job done. So, you know, like during the Iraq war, I interviewed 100 reporters about the Iraq war, and a lot of them would just, well, yeah, David Petraeus said this, and so I guess I'm supposed to repeat it now or whatever. And with him, it wasn't a matter of he would get it right on the follow-up question. Like, he always got it right in the first place. I didn't have to, like you know, set the question up, hey, isn't it true that they haven't proven that any of these EFP bombs are really coming from Iran? He just would bring it up anyway himself. He already knew that was the important point. Right. That, yeah, they keep saying these bombs come from Iran, but there ain't the slightest bit of evidence yet. I'm pretty sure yeah. that was some of the first stuff we talked about back in, you know, 07 and whatever. And, and uh, you know, his piece on Afghanistan, he's not embedded with the Americans. He's out cruising around on the Duran line, hanging out in Pashtunistan, unembedded, just reporting on the real war. You know what I mean? Like, uh, there there are very few reporters. You know, I think of uh, Patrick Coburn and David Enders and a few others who are really willing to get out there and risk their skin like that. Skay Hill, of course. Um, There are very few who are willing to... Um, who have that that very independent attitude that you're talking about, and but then also the the very real willingness to be over there in danger, getting the job done. Yeah, you, know? you have to think about this, Scott. 
and, and I, I will tell you that I thought about it, and, and I think this is what really, you know, it, it, it's what really made me sad is, um, you know, it, in, in my reporting about Guantanamo and, and, and Michael's reporting about, uh, you know, whether it's the Afghanistan hospital or whether it was um, a Hollywood producer, you know, who ended up in jail, um, uh, which is one of his recent stories. You know, I've asked myself um, many times, you know, why, why do I continue doing this reporting? Um, and it's, it's a difficult question to answer because it's, uh, it's not sexy. Uh, it's certainly uh, not making me any friends. And, uh, you know, the same goes with, with Michael. And, you know, he knew that. And, you know, he certainly didn't care about that. And uh, it, 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 it's amazing that, um, you know, we, th- th- there's a lot of risks that, you know, that we take. Uh, as reporters. And uh, I, I really cannot answer that question as to why, you know, um, you know, keep uh, continue to do this type of work. And, and uh, you know, I, I know that for me, I'm just compelled to to do it. It's it's just, you know, I, I feel like I'm just chasing something that eventually I'll, you know, find, you know, whatever the truth is. And, uh, you know, I, I think Michael's work um, you know his body of work is is incredible uh, in in that it it really shows that he too was you know chasing uh, you know not just the truth but but really wanted to um, let the public know that you know what they're being told is not exactly uh, uh, certainly it, it, it's not the truth necessarily and it, and it's not exactly the way it seems. There's you know the, the, there's a whole different world and the only way to do that. Is to really be independent, to be unembedded, to be, you know, to to you know, he took his observations, you know, and shared it with everyone. And you know, I was uh, <clears throat> reading some of these tweets, and you know, Geraldo Rivera, you know, uh, uh, tweeted yesterday, uh, you know, a tragedy about the uh, uh, about the death of uh, Michael Hastings. But uh, you know, let's not forget that he uh, was responsible for taking down uh, or for ruining the career of one of our best generals. And it, you know that it, it, it angered me, it frustrated me, it, because he he committed an act of journalism. You know, it was actually the you know General McChrystal himself, you know, who was responsible for his own behavior. You know, Michael was there in in in, in uh, uh, reporting and, and you know observed what was happening and and shared that. And that is the type of journalism that you don't see. And that kind of response, you know, from a guy like Geraldo Rivera, which you know, I don't think of him as a journalist, but it really did. It, it, you know what? It, what it did for me is that it um, it really sort of kind of showed where where we are right now in terms of journalism. And you know, this uh, I'll use the you know the, the latest um, uproar uh, with Edward Snowden, the um, you know the contractor who was uh, you know working with the NSA as an example. It's it's striking to me, Scott, how many journalists. Well-known journalists, professional journalists, people who um, you know are are supposed to be out there, you know, digging up the dirt, pounding the pavement, and uh, you know, revealing the truth, are so uh, uh, you know their their response to all of this is is just I, you know I'm not sure if it's just based in opinion, but but it's it's more or less that they're you know they're 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 they're, they're not doing their jobs. And, well, uh, you know, the thing is, I think Josh Marshall at the Talking Points memo, sort of out of the mouths yeah. of babes kind of a thing, just he, he put it perfectly from the point of view of the bad guys. He said, look, some of us reporters identify with the regime, and some of you others are the outcast types. <laughs> Excuse me. And it's like, yeah, that's right. You're a fascist bootlicking toady, barely a human <laughs> right. at all. Please yeah, continue on your way. honest about it. I mean, but it's, I guess that I'm, you know, maybe I'm naive because I didn't expect that. And I didn't expect to see, you know, I know that the world of, uh, you know, scoop journalism, uh, having been in it, having made, you know, some mistakes as a reporter in that world, um, is incredibly competitive and, and, you know, we eat our own. But this is, you know, what, what, what I've been seeing is just incredibly sad because, uh, uh, you know, no one's really willing to, you know, to step up and say, hey, you know, 
actually, excuse me, I, I will say the Matt Apuzo from the Associated Press, you know, he actually said, well, you know, these are questions we should have been asking, you know, years ago. And, and had we done that, and, and he included himself, yeah. you know, we, we wouldn't be asking, you know, these questions now. And it's just incredible to see, you know, the type of response um, that uh, that's being uh, uh, put out there publicly by journalists. Right. And, of course, and Hastings really was out the there in full force on his Twitter feed, backing Snowden, backing Greenwald, and and shouting down the detractors, and and you know, yeah. rollicking and and having a great old time getting involved in the fight right away too. Yeah, I mean, the, and, and look, you know, it, you know, you said uh, you know, you used the word backing Snowden, you know, and I think that's that's really what you know. For me, I, I mean, I'm I'm not backing anyone. You know, I'm I'm interested in in asking more questions and finding out, you know, and uh, uh, trying to obtain more information. You know, uh, and and what I've seen, you know, and and how this relates to, you know, Michael Hastings is that kind of response. You know, it's a, it's like I can't forget uh, Laura Laura Logan from CBS when, um, uh, you know, when, when she was so highly critical. Of his reporting with Michael Hastings reporting and, and, and basically, mm-hmm. you know, said that uh, you know McChrystal was this uh, you know great American and Michael Hastings will never be the you know the type of American or uh, I'm paraphrasing here and I may be messing it up, but uh, the gist is is that uh, you know he he's no McChrystal and this is a woman who's a reporter you know she she wears that you know that badge I'm a journalist she works for you know for CBS and. Um, and, and and that's really where we are. So his loss, you know, um, aside from the fact that, you know, that I knew him and was getting to know him, you know, very well, knew what he was, you know, what he was working on and, and uh, you know, sharing some stories is is a loss for everyone. And uh, as you noted, there really are very few people that are out there doing this type of work, taking these types of risks. And, you know, it's, it's difficult. This is a, a very sort of difficult um, job to do, particularly right now, Scott, because people are not um, speaking to journalists. You know, um, one of the reasons that I was speaking to, you know, to, to Michael about Freedom of Information Act is because, you know, I have sources, but I'm, I'm here in Los Angeles. And uh, it, it's very difficult to, you know, for sources to feel comfortable, you know, uh, Speaking to me about uh, certain government activity, there's really no incentive for them to do it anymore. If it could mean that they will, uh, you know, be prosecuted, investigated. So, uh, you know, the the alternative methods uh, is, is using uh, the Freedom of Information Act as 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 uh, flawed as it is to you know to try and obtain you know, information. Well, that's, you know, one of the biggest stories of this decade, I think, that has gone so underreported is the chilling of sources for investigative journalists in this country and what that's really uh, come to mean for journalism and all that. But I'm sorry to stop because um, I I need to ask you about the cause of death here, because obviously, as you mentioned, he's working on CIA stories as a matter of course. Michael Hastings is making powerful enemies because he didn't cover the local zoo beat. He covered the who ought to be in real trouble beat. And uh, and so, you know, people are concerned about that. On the other hand, I saw a video this morning that looks to be him blowing through a, a very solidly red light at Santa Monica and Highland this morning. Um, you have any idea what the hell he was doing out at 430 in the morning? Or do you have an opinion yeah. about, you know, all the suspicions and whatever? You know, I don't. Uh, you know, he was working on stories. I know. Look, a, a lot of people working on stories like that. Um, and, and yeah, WikiLeaks. Those, I should you know, mention. I'm sorry. I there. should mention Jason in my setup here that WikiLeaks is saying, "Oh, he contacted our lawyer just before he died," and this kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure why WikiLeaks, you know, said that, and I'm not sure. Obviously, they're you know trying to make a point in that. They did the same thing with Aaron Swartz, you know, the um, internet activist who. Uh, uh, who killed himself, um, you know, saying that, uh, you know, he contacted them or he helped them. Uh, you know, the implication is, is that there was murder, there was foul play. Um, but I, I have absolutely, you know, no idea. All I know is that, uh, you know, he was out 4.30 in the morning. I'm aware of, 
you know, I've lived in L.A. for a, a long time. I know Highland and Melrose. It's a uh, I do too. Uh, it's uh, it, it's notorious for accidents. Um, you know, and uh, I certainly don't want to um, you know get into that area uh, without really knowing anything other than the fact that you know at this point it just looks like there was you know it, and actually it was going very fast. Um, I actually read I, I actually I, I'm read one the page, same video Jason. That where you are so. I'm, I'm I'm sorry. What was the last part? I, I'm watch, I watched the same video you watched, you know, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, so that's uh, you know that, that that's pretty much it. I, I'm not sure. Uh, it, I mean, I am very interested in what WikiLeaks, you know, <laughs> what what their you know their point was and all that. Uh, I mean, they they sort of throw out this tweet and then move away, you know. Well, why? Well, you know, know, I mean, um, I could have tweeted that, you know, he had just been meeting with Jason Leopold about a FOIA request or, you know, so what? Right. Yeah. Yeah. He he was a journalist. He he called lawyers and things sometimes or what, you know, maybe he was being investigated by the FBI, but the FBI, I I don't know. I I actually, um, uh, you you know, when I heard about, um, you know, about his death and, uh, actually heard about it from your wife, uh, um, Larissa. And uh, I, you know, immediately filed actually a Freedom of Information Act request with the FBI and uh, asking for his case file, if any or if anything exists. There so, you, you know, just because, first of all, that's what I do. Um, and and I'm, I'm pretty well known for, you know, for doing that. So I, I filed that, you know, I look, you know, I did the same thing when uh, Hugo Chavez died of, you know, Ask the FBI for for his file as well. So, uh, you know, we'll see if anything comes from that. If if, if there's anything in there, but yeah. you know, at this point, it's um, for me and and, and many um, and many people, um, including you, I imagine it's you know, it's a loss of a great journalist. You know, someone who was just working on incredible stories that um, you know we won't get the chance to read. Uh-huh. Um, uh, hopefully, you know, perhaps somebody will pick up you know pick up. Uh, uh, you know what 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 he was uh, working on and run with it, but uh, you know it's really a loss for all of us because he was doing some some great work, and, and he really believed um, in what he was doing. And he was incredibly passionate, and that kind of passion is just really difficult to find right now. Yeah, certainly true. I want to mention real quick about that that um, well, something about L.A. always compelled me to drive fast too, especially on the freeways there. They're it's the whole damn town is like a racetrack to me. I don't know. I guess apparently <laughs> he saw it that way too. Um, yeah. You know, he's a, he's a brash young male. It makes sense that he might be driving fast in the middle of the night. You know what I mean? There's nothing uh, suspicious about that. I wanted to point out that I read um, one of these sites where someone had a theory. The comment section seemed to be populated with car experts, right? Not people who are interested in politics or journalism at all, but people who are just, you know, insane about cars. And right, they were talking yeah. about how, yeah, it looks like an accident. Give me a break. And and they pretty much all, you know, were unanimous about that. One of them even said if he'd been in a lesser car, it might have broken in half and, and tossed him free of the fire. But because he was in a Mercedes, it held together and unfortunately, you know, um, yeah. worked against him in this particular uh, case, but it's just a random chance. You know what I mean? It's like they found bones from September 11th on top of skyscrapers a mile away. Like, how the hell did that happen? Who knows? Right. R- numbers. Throw a bunch of numbers in a random generator thing and see what happens. A bunch of terrible stuff. Who knows? Yeah. You yeah. Know? Anyway. Yeah. No. I mean, and 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 like I said, I've lived in LA for a while. It's a car city, and uh, you know, it, there there's no. Uh, time when you can't turn on when when you do not turn on the television uh, that you won't see a car chase. You know, I saw it last night. You know, car chase, car crash. Uh, I mean, breaking news here, Scott is uh, you know we have a car accident and a wreck at uh, you know uh, at uh, on La Cienega. Uh, I mean, that that literally they'll cut into the news or, or we'll we'll get some breaking news about that. You'll see well, in fact, part of the so. reporting on Hastings was that. This was the only crash that happened in L.A. last night, and that was unique. Yeah. You know? That, I will say that actually is pretty unique, you know, because it's, uh, like I said, it's L.A., and, you know, it's, uh, uh, there's, there's many, many accidents. Um, you know, I, I live on a, on a road where every morning, you know, people are, are just speeding, and uh, uh, 
oftentimes I'll wake up to, you know, so um, it's uh, it, it, that 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 is certainly, um, you know, not unusual for L.A. But, uh, you know, look, I mean, obviously, like I said, you know, uh, the tweet by WikiLeaks was, you know, uh, what, what's the impression? It's clear. Or what's the implication? That there was foul play, that he was murdered, that this was not just a car accident. Um, and, um, you know, for me, and I'm not really, you know, um, yeah, you know, you know my going, thing is that place, yeah. he better really be going somewhere with that or that's going to really piss me off, you know? Right. Well, like I said, it was the same thing about, um, you know, about Aaron Swartz. I mean, the, you know, the, the, Aaron Swartz was doing, you know, incredible, uh, incredible work as well. Um, and and I, and I think that there are legitimate questions to ask about, you know, what the government was doing. And, and, and uh, look, you know, if the government was investigating, you know, Michael Hastings, would that be um, a surprise, given that we already know that the government is investigating or, um, you know, have been looking at uh, 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 the Fox News reporter, uh, you know, the Associated Press, True, uh, New yeah. York Times. No, it's not a surprise. In fact, uh, you know, you, I, I would imagine that uh, anyone doing that type of work these days should know that, uh, hey, you know, you're 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 uh, you're being watched, or, or there's a, a chance that you could be. Yeah. Uh, so, not sure. surprised about that. Yeah, you know, uh, the Fox News lady couldn't believe it when Ron Paul said, "Yeah, I mean, I'm concerned that Barack Obama's just going to kill this Ed Snowden with a drone." Or, you know, just send assassins after him or something. And the the lady just thought this was the silliest thing she ever heard. And I only wish that he had said, don't you remember the news last week was a Fox News reporter was an unindicted co-conspirator in an espionage case for doing reporting out of the State Department, lady? Your colleague. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, I, I mean, and certainly in that uh, chat with The Guardian, you know, Edward, Edward Snowden, you know, said that, uh, uh, you know, the government's not going to be able to, you know, to to uh, silence me and or, uh, you know, by mur- he actually used the word murder me. Uh, you know, that this is not going to go away uh, by murdering me or or or, or uh, silencing me. But, uh, uh, you know, clearly the reaction to that was what what's wrong with this guy? You know, he's uh, uh, he's sort of nuts for even you know thinking that way. You know, it's a you know, to, to sort of like bring it back down to you know, um, well, yeah, to a place where people can understand. It's very, very dangerous right now to report. <laughs> excuse me, to report on uh, government activity. It really is dangerous, Scott. And and I when I say dangerous, I don't mean dangerous in the sense that you know a drone is going to come and you know in 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 to West LA and and you know, take me out. It's just dangerous in the sense that people, you know, that I speak to don't want to speak. Um, uh, there, there, there's just, like I said, there's no incentive. Mm -hmm. The administration, this administration, um, has made it clear that if you reveal, uh, uh, any government activity, particularly activity that has to do with national security, counterterrorism, uh, we'll go after you. Uh, you know, the whole, you know, uh, the, you know, what the government did with regard to the Associated Press, when, when, when we found out that, you know, that they were, uh, you know, uh, grabbed their phone records, um, ultimately what that, you know, what, what the whole point of that was is to ensure, Scott, that their sources will never speak to them again or they'll have a very difficult time cultivating sources. Right. Because now anyone who is a potential source knows that uh, the government will go to great lengths to try to find out who you are. All right, now hold so, it right there. Can I keep you over uh, into the next segment here? Because I didn't sure. get a chance to let you talk about your new story at all. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Scott. Okay, good deal. Everybody, this is uh, Jason Leopold, great reporter for Al Jazeera. We'll be right back on Scott Horton Show after this. ScottHorton.org. Oh, man, I'm late. 
Sure hope I can make my flight. Stand there. Me? I am standing here. Come here. Okay. Hands up. Turn around. Oh, easy. Into the scanner. Ooh, what's this in your pants? Hey, slow down. It's just my... Hold it right there. Your wallet has tripped the metal detector. What's this? The bill of rights? That's right. It's just a harmless stainless steel business card-sized copy of the Bill of Rights from SecurityEdition.com. They're for exposing the TSA as a bunch of liberty-destroying goons who've never protected anyone from anything. Sir, now give me back my wallet and get out of my way. Got a plane to catch. Have a nice day. Play a leading role in the security theater with the Bill of Rights Security Edition from SecurityEdition.com. It's the size of a business card, so it fits right in your wallet, and it's guaranteed to trip the metal detectors wherever the police state goes. That's SecurityEdition.com. And don't forget their great Fourth Amendment socks. Hey guys, I got his laptop. Admit it, our public debate has been reduced to reading each other's bumper stickers. Scott Horton here for LibertyStickers.com. I made up most of them and most of those when I was mad as hell about something. So if you hate war, empire, central banking, cops, Republicans, Democrats, gun grabbers, and status of all stripes, go to LibertyStickers.com and there's a good chance you'll find just what you need for the back of your truck. Own a bookstore? Sell guns at the show? Get the wholesaler's deal. Buy any hundred stickers and they drop down in price to a dollar a piece. You can spread the contempt and make a little money too. That's LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, you own a business? Maybe we should consider advertising on the show. See if we can make a little bit of money. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. It's the Scott Horton Show. I'm talking with Jason Leopold, now at Al Jazeera, author of News Junkie. And we were talking about Michael Hastings, but now we got to talk about Guantanamo Bay. Oh, but first, I got to I gotta mention, since you talked about, well, I'm not scared that they're going to kill me with a drone. It's just that they've made it dangerous for my sources to talk to me on the phone and that kind of thing. Um, well, you know, the head of the FBI admitted that he's flying drones around, presumably L.A., and I would presume over your house, you know, on a regular <laughs> basis, just yesterday. Yeah. And uh, it's not just the Austin Police Department and some county sheriffs up in, what, Montana or whatever. Uh, it's the FBI flying drones for uh, police use against American citizens already. They now concede. Yeah. Well, look, Scott, I, let, let me just say one thing about that. You know, I'm, uh, I, I think years ago, this probably would have sounded like crazy conspiracy theory. So, you know, as you know, I, I, I write quite a bit on Guantanamo. And, uh, you know, recently I've written, you know, many stories about the death of uh, a Guantanamo prisoner named uh, Adnan Latif. Uh-huh. You know, he's a Yemeni. I had made, I, I, I've made many, many, many calls to Yemen, uh, you know, speaking to his family. And I assume that, uh, you know, I'm calling Yemen, I'm speaking to his family, I'm talking about Guantanamo, talking about his death, talking about, uh, uh, you know, terrorism. Um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, that, that call was, uh, was, was monitored. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that w- that's not a surprise to me. You know, it's, um, you know, but I will say that there is... You know there are very important steps journalists do need to take, uh, certainly to you know to 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 ensure uh, you know that their electronic communications are you know that 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 they're uh, conversing in ways that are you know are protected. So uh, you know whether that means you know doing it on uh, on some sort of you know secure network or or you know if you're if you're communicating via Gmail with you know sources, well that's kind of you know ridiculous you should yeah <laughs> you, sh- you shouldn't be surprised if uh if some trouble happens well you know i'm not giving away any sources and methods or anything but i know that when uh larissa was reporting a lot of her you know most important national security beat stuff for raw story back a few years ago she might as well have been a spy the rigmarole she went through with all of her code names right and- Secret methods of getting information here, there, the other place. You know, it, I, I, that is it, yeah, if you don't just, want the National Security Agency in on everything that you're doing as a journalist. Let me just add one more thing to that. You know, when John Kiriakou, the former CIA 
officer who is now in prison, um, uh, you know, for for uh, what he, you know, uh, revealed, um, you know, to some journalists. I mean, I will say this, that, you know, John, given his background, um, you know, if you look at the indictment, uh, I believe it's the indictment, but it, it showed that they basically collected his communications from, um, you know, they, they, they collected his emails. Where was he communicating from in which he revealed this information? His Hotmail account. Uh, so, you know, it, the, the point being that uh, it, it appears that, first of all, they, you know, they, they got his Hotmail account. I'm not sure if they got it before, you know, if they went directly to, you know, to Microsoft or if they simply just went to his computer and went through all of his emails. But that is just an example of um, poor operational security. You know, you don't reveal information, whatever it is, you know, to a journalist, you know, through Hotmail. So, uh, or any of those free, you know, uh, email services. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that, you know that, that, that should certainly be, you know, a lesson not just for uh, those sources, but, you know, journalists as well, you know, don't, don't reach out to your sources using, uh, you know, using, using those, uh, those services, because it's, uh, you know, if you do wind up getting some information, it, it, uh, it, it, and, and it's classified, it could come back and, uh, haunt you. That's good advice for anyone, really. I mean, think about anybody who's running a business that's big enough that their competitor might have some political connections, you know what I mean? Or anything like right. that. Definitely don't use Hotmail. <laughs> you know, yeah, so. yeah. Do not use Hotmail. Do not I, use I, I think that's uh, that. That should be the uh, you know phrase of the day. Yeah, there you go. All right. Now listen. Tell us about. Well, first of all, tell us about Latif because you have done a lot of great reporting on this, and it's it it works. It's, it's part of your story here. Your latest um, again, everybody's uh, the great Jason Leopold, a Guantanamo tour. Much ado about nothing. Uh, it's at uh, Al Jazeera English, Al Jazeera dot com. Yeah, and the title, uh, you know, the headline of that story. I mean, the uh, the much ado about nothing. I mean, where people had hopefully you know taken the time to read it. It's a lengthy story. We'll understand that it's basically, uh, you know, I, I had uh, met a a nurse there who was uh, uh, you know doing some of the force feedings, uh, overseeing the force feedings and, and and conducting them, and uh, no one at Guantanamo, uh, you know, none of the uh, uh, soldiers, and certainly. Uh, the doctors or anyone in the military will will give us their names. And uh, when we went to the hospital, there was a nurse there who who had a fake name. His name was Leonato, uh, which he had adopted from the uh, play uh, Much Ado About Nothing, uh, the Shakespeare Shakespeare's play. And uh, in fact, he said at one point, uh, you know, the detainees have a much you know much lo- live longer here uh, than they would uh, if they were in their home country. Um, and anyway, he was, you know, trying to say that the, the whole yeah, but not if they can help it. They're all feeding. trying to commit suicide by starvation, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, that that's that's the reason for the you know for the headline with regard to Latif. You know, I'm actually working on a, you know, on a follow up right now. It's been about nine months since he died. He is <clears throat> his autopsy report has still not been released. Has not even been released to his family. Uh and as far as I can tell, has not been released to uh, you know certain members of uh, of uh, uh, you know government uh, uh, Yemeni government officials. Uh, so you know there are certainly you know some questions um, that still remain, obviously about uh, you know the circumstances behind his death. There's also an NCIS uh, uh, Naval Criminal Investigative uh, Service investigation NCIS uh, investigation into his death. Apparently, that's still ongoing. Uh, and finally, there's also a report that uh, that the United States Southern Command uh, did into conducted into his death. It's called a uh, uh, you know commander's inquiry, uh, and that report is actually finished, Scott. And it was supposed to be released back. It was finished in mid-November. It was supposed to be released in March, maybe February, March. Well, it's now you know in you know sitting at uh, the Pentagon. Uh, you know, behind some some red tape, uh, <laughs> excuse me, it appears that it's not being released because the information in the report uh, may prove to be embarrassing. 
uh, to, um, you know, certainly to, you know, to Joint Task Force Guantanamo, to the military. Uh, and, and given the, you know, the public relations disaster surrounding the hunger strike, you know, the timing of it isn't, uh, you know, uh, isn't the best. Uh, I will say that, uh, you know, the government says that, uh, or the Pentagon said to me that, uh, you know, the reason that the report hasn't been released is, uh, you know, first it needs to be shared with, uh, uh, you know, the Yemeni government, uh, Yemeni government officials, and uh, after that they'll make a decision on releasing it. They dispute that it's that you know that that it's being held back for any um, for any reasons about uh, you know trying to you know hide embarrassing information. But uh, you know, his story, um, Adnan Latif, his death has actually been lost. Um, or, or forgotten, you know, in, in this, in the whole, uh, uh, story revolving around the hunger strike, which I, which I think is very sad. In fact, I spoke to, uh, one of the attorneys, uh, over who, who represents one of the prisoners. And I found out that, that her client, uh, you know, one of these prisoners on hunger strike actually started his hunger strike after Adnan Latif died. So there's, it, it turns out that there's several, who have been on hunger strike actually since last September, um, protesting his death. And, uh, you know, they don't believe he died, uh, that he committed suicide. <clears throat> so there, there are still many, many questions that, uh, you know, that need to be answered uh, about his death. Certainly, you know, how was he able to um, hoard, you know, the, the, the medication uh, that... Um, that uh, you know the, the the government claims uh, he or the military claims that he did uh, collected enough for a lethal dose. In fact, when I was at Guantanamo, and this is what's going to be my next report, I can tell you that. So I, I had the opportunity to interview two guards, and um, I brought up the question about Adnan Latif's death, and I said to them, uh, you know, these were guards, one who worked in Camp Five where where he died, and uh, this was a woman, and I said to her, how. Could a prisoner, uh, uh, or I should say, how could a detainee, because it's made very clear to us, Scott, when we're at Guantanamo, that they're not prisoners, they're detainees. You know, that's not a prison, it's a detention facility. How about captives? Uh, I'm sorry? How about captives? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. no. And you'll, get a, you'll be corrected. <laughs> and uh, uh, very, very quickly, you know, no, that's wrong, Scott. It's a... Uh, it's, it's, these are detainees, you know, um, belligerents. And, uh, and, and truly that's, that, that, that's the kind of response you'll get. But yeah, right. and, her, and as you point out in the, in the uh, story, they're not enemy combatants. They're unprivileged belligerents. That's literally the change made from Bush to Obama, the exact right. same policy, uh, notwithstanding. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, just, just a different label. You know, the same thing that he did with the war on terror. Uh, he uh, uh, retired that phrase, and I guess there's, there's another one that he, you know, that he chose. Um, but I did ask this guard. I said, how is it that if you guys walk the block, okay, you're walking the block every, you know, you're, you're pacing back and forth, you're walking it, you're checking in the cells every one to three minutes. How is it that a prisoner would be able to, to hoard enough medication that they would then, you know, collect a lethal dose to commit suicide. Not just any prisoner, by the way, but Adnan Latif, who was mentally ill. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, Joint Task Force Guantanamo public affairs official immediately interrupted, saying, hey, hey, we're not going there. Uh, we're not going to discuss that. And I said, why? Why not? You know, this is, these are legitimate questions. And just did not want me to get into, um, you know, any questions surrounding any prisoner. Because, first of all, they don't discuss any prisoner specifically. They won't discuss any prisoner by name. They won't discuss um, any prisoner by, you know, their, their uh, internment uh, numbers. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult. Um, Latif, uh, you know, since he died, there were, there were some questions that they were willing to answer. But, you know, for the most part off limits. However, this guard said, you know, actually answered the question and answered it in a way that I found very interesting. She said, well, sir, I don't know how they would, you know, be able to um, uh, collect enough medication 
to, you know, commit suicide because we have to watch them, you know, take their medication. And in addition to that, most of the medication, I guess that she has seen, has been administered, and this is what she said, in the liquid form that it's it's she she claimed it was rare in her experience to see any of the corpsmen administering you know pills uh or or or, or medication that came in, in 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 you know a capsule or a pill and that in fact it was uh you know in in liquid form which obviously raises questions about uh you know what kind of medication was you know Latif given what uh uh you know what was it uh you know, in, in pill form, liquid form. So, uh, you know, the point being that uh, there are uh, uh, unsolved or, 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 or issues that are unresolved here um, and questions that, that still need to be answered. Now, of course, I followed up with, with what she said, you know, with uh, uh, the military, and uh, they just won't answer that question. Um, you know, when I, when I asked uh, about what the guard said, they just would not go there. So, uh, you know, the, this, this was more or less what, um, you know, what, what this tour of Guantanamo was like. And I really tried to, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I really tried to, you know, capture that in, in the story, you know, started out, um, by, you know, I think I discussed this with you, uh, last time we spoke, you know, started out the tour by, you know, seeing this prisoner staring at me, through a cage, through a cell, um, and giving me a thumbs down sign, you know, ended it by by walking through Camp X Ray and seeing a rat in 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 one of the cages where a prisoner, you know, banana rat in one of the cages where a prisoner was in, and it was just it was so striking to me this sort of you know the, these 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 bookends, if you will, you know, starting it with you know. Human being in a cage and, and a rat in a cage, and it was it was strange. It was it was a, a very uh, uh, it, it, it was surreal, and uh, you know the the whole experience about you know not being able to you know refer to them as prisoners, um, not being able to you know uh, speak about uh, or, or or discuss them by name. Um, uh, the uh, restraints, you know, the shackles, as I refer to them, I was corrected on that. They're they're um, uh, not uh, shackles; they're humane uh, restraints, and, and 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 that's not a joke, Scott. They're, that's what they call them. Well, were uh, they humane? They're wrapped in felt, or uh, yes, uh, they're <laughs> you know, they're. But but the point being that it's not force feeding; it's enteral feeding. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's not torture, it's enhanced interrogation techniques. It's, it's, it, you know, and, and you can seriously in, 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 in that little bit of time, Scott gets so caught up in not just the euphemisms, but how that affects you psychologically, because it removes all images of what, you know, what, what, what would be conjured, what would normally be conjured up by mentioning these, you know, these phrases, you know, when you, when you think of forced feeding, you know, what kind of image comes to mind? Uh, perhaps it's someone like, you know, shoving food down someone's throat. Uh, you know, enteral feeding is very, you know, sanitized, uh, you know, humane restraints. It's, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking it perhaps in, in, in medical terms. So you're, you're removing, um, you know, any sort of, uh, uh, image of, of brutality. You know, and, I think that's me, such like an important point, Jason. That. To, that's such an important point, like George Carlin says about, you know, you think in language. And so you can be corrupted if people can manipulate the language that we use. You know, you talk about force feeding and the images it conjures, if you if you put it that way. A friend in the chat room, I guess, last week or the week before said, well, I think of the hammer and sickle when you say force feeding. That used to be Ronald Reagan's big thing to he liked to beat Mikhail Gorbachev over the head about was force feeding their political prisoners who were trying to starve themselves to death. And what kind of right. horrible totalitarian monstrosity is that? 
And, right, right. And so exactly. you do have to. It's very important that you change the jargon to something that doesn't have an association with something else you already know about, especially something else that maybe your own government has trained you to condemn when it's a splinter in the eye of somebody else. Yeah, you know, this is, uh, I, I may have discussed this with you before, but in my stories when I'm writing about Guantanamo, um, you know, I've used the, I don't use detainees. I use prisoners. You know, they're, it, it's pretty clear at this point after 11 years that they're prisoners. And why would I use detainees? Well, you know, that's certainly the word that the government wants me to use. Uh, and they, you know, they, they're very serious about that. Uh, but, it, you know, the, the, the point being is that, you know, I have the power to, you know, to sort of change it. It's, uh, you know, it, it's certainly not something or, or even use the word captive. Um, which I know Carol Rosenberg of the Miami Herald, she uses that, you know, quite a bit. But I, I, I'm telling you, it was so, you know, after just a couple of days, and you're hearing this over and over again, you know, I had to remind myself um, truly that, it, it, you know, cannot get caught up in, um, in in using these words, these euphemisms, or, or letting it sort of, uh, you know, dictate where, you know, where my story goes. And it's, uh, you know, there's a, this point where I discuss in my, you know, in my story here that, you know, we're taking this ferry ride, you know, to, you know, to one side of the island. And, and, and the, the scene itself was, was beautiful, Scott. You know, it's Cuba. You're, you're, you're looking at this, um, you know, these beautiful cliffs and, and uh, wildlife and, and water. And, and, you know, it, it was a remarkable scene, but I had to stop and say and remind myself that, this is the. I, I'm traveling right now to a place, to a prison, where the worst, some of the worst human rights abuses, um, in uh, you know, in, in the past uh, decade, obviously, have taken place. Where you know, hundreds of prisoners were brutally tortured, where men committed suicide, uh, where you know, or so we're told. I mean, where you know, th this was. Um, uh, you know, th this was a very, very dark place that, you know, that I was traveling to. So it was, you know, and then and then you enter the prison, um, and it's really like entering another world because there are these pillars that spell out honor bound, you know, um, and uh, it's it's like whoa, you know, you're 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 seeing these, you know, honor bound, and uh, you, you're you're getting caught up in. You know the value of the week. There's a sign there that's a value of the week, integrity, and it's like it 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 could it it made me dizzy. <laughs> it's like <laughs> kindergarten know, kind of. Discussion. Well, it's a government program, right? So it's all government language, especially the military. Everything is new speak weirdo jargon in the military. You can't even call right. it the Delta Force, right? It's the CAG or whatever. Right. Right. Everything yeah, has so, its so silly it, little name. Yeah, and and, and so it was really. Um, I mean, it, it was it was an important trip, and you know this was a pretty difficult story to write because, and I'm going to be honest with you here, is that you know the what what made it difficult is is having to is being so it was being so honest because I knew that what I'm writing is not going to what I was writing was not going to make you know the military happy was not going to make you know. The escorts that I had, you know, particularly happy, possibly, uh, and you know, and, you know, when you, when you're surround or when you're with, you know, some of these folks, um, and this actually goes to sort of like you know what we discussed at the beginning of your, uh, of your show with uh, you know with Michael Hastings, um, you know that that you know your reporting is not you're you're not supposed to make anyone happy. And, uh, you know, but being around them during my you know, time of my trip, you, could, you know, I could see or I got it. I, I got to know them a bit. They were, you know, they were in the military. Guantanamo was not a choice that they made They didn't sign up, say, hey, I want to go to Guantanamo. But it is a deployment. And they were, you know, perfectly nice people with families. And they were doing, you know, their jobs in terms of, you know, public relations. Um, but. You know, writing the story was difficult because, you know, like I said, walk as I say in the story, walking through Camp X-Ray um, was like walking through the remnants of a concentration camp. I don't see how anyone can see it any other way, Scott. You know, the way that it's set up, the way that it looks, 
it looks like a concentration camp. And and I said that. I wrote that. And I, and I think it's very important to me that anyone who's reading this takes away that image, um, that, that, that understands that that is what this place looks like. That's, that's what, you know, that's what we set up. So, um, you know, being truly, you know, honest, you know, seeing this, as I said, seeing this, you know, bearded man in a cage and, and letting people know that what I saw at that moment, you know, wasn't a, you know, a member of Al, of Al Qaeda, um, possibly. And, and, and we know just from the, you know, the fact that it's a low level prisoner likely wasn't, uh, but it was just a human being in a cage giving me a thumbs down sign, probably in, in a way to, to protest his, you know, the past 11 years that he's been, you know, held without charge or trial. Yeah, I mean, look and, at it. Even if he got one shot before the judge and the judge agreed with him on the writ of habeas corpus under the Bomedian decision that, yeah, I don't really see much of a case for holding this guy. He still could just be sitting there the rest of his life anyway. And the right. indefinite detention. And you know what? We're almost out of time. i got to go to Dan Ellsberg soon. Uh, but I wanted to ask you real quick and get your comment sure. on this, whether you think this is important the way I do. But I keep reading about how the actual worst bad guys being held there, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramsey bin al-Sheib, and then this guy, I guess it was Ben Atash or one of these guys, that because there's no law, because this is all just made up nonsense, the so-called law governing the court process there, the ones who are actually even getting a pretend right. trial at all, and not just being held for life on Obama's say-so, um, that they get to wear camouflage military-style hunting vests so that they can Correct. pretend that yeah. they're generals in the al-Qaeda war against America instead of, being, instead of just sitting there in an orange jumpsuit and being treated like the scum of the earth, like some uh, rapist or murderer uh, on his way to Rikers Island or whatever. They get to strut around acting like they're military commanders, the butchers of New York. And I just thought, you know... They can't get a damn thing right down there, can they? <laughs> it's true, and that was a very big, uh, you know, big controversy. Is that look, you know, they're if they're having a military commission, um, you know, and and this is, uh, you know, sort of like, you know, a trial on a battlefield, if you will. Well, then they should have the opportunity to wear, uh, you know, that sort of garb to show that they're, you know, that 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 that's. Who they are and, which of and, course and is play. their defense that we're not criminals uh this is a war and we're the generals in the war and you kill people on your side and so we kill yours too and whatever everybody's right. the same here not guilty your honor that's their right. argument but, and know, we hand a, it to them here's the thing scott is that this that as you know this is so this, this is no one gets to see this you get to read about it but no one gets to see it so you know ultimately at the end of the day it really is you know does it make a difference um yeah, you know, I get what not. you're saying is that, you know, that they can't get anything right. But, um, you know, that's part of the problem that, you know, w about having this, you know, in, in a corner of, uh, you know, of Guantanamo uh, wh where nobody gets to, you know, to witness anything. Right. Um, well, that's why they put it in Communist Cuba in the first place. So it would be out of right. reach of anybody except, you know, on their guided tour. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and it's supposed to be out of reach of... Uh, even the courts and whatever, as Obama said in his recent speech where he pretended again that he meant to close it at all. Did you take that seriously at all, by the way? Um, I did not take it seriously. Okay. And, I, and, and I will tell you that I did, you know, I mean, will you take seriously if I tell you that I want to win the lottery and I'm determined to do it? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess. Okay. Um, you know, but it wouldn't but, mean uh, that I've much to me, play, really. Right, you know, um, yeah. you know, look, he appointed or his administration is appointing someone at the State Department you know, to fill the uh, vacancy about uh, shutting Guantanamo. There, there, there's a lot, um, uh, a, a lot of bureaucracy, in, you know, that, that, that's involved in this. And, and it is going to be difficult because of all the politics that are involved. Ultimately, though, Scott, you know, Obama does have the power as president to start moving some of these folks out um, who've already been cleared. He hasn't done that. Um, he still hasn't done that, you know, since his speech, as far as I can tell. You know, there hasn't been any sort of, you know, request, uh, you know, to, um, you know, to, to, to start releasing anyone. So right. I'm sorry, um, we're out of time. I just don't think so. We got to go. Thank you very much for your time on the show, Jason. It's great to talk to you again. Thanks, Scott. Have a good one. Everybody, that's the great Jason Leopold. Uh, now writing at AljazeeRa.com. The latest is a Guantanamo tour.
Much ado about nothing? Uh, yeah, no. Not enough ado about a lot. That's what it's really about. And we'll be right back here in just a moment with the American hero, Daniel Ellsberg. So you're a libertarian, and you don't believe the propaganda about government awesomeness you were subjected to in fourth grade. You want real history and economics. Well, learn in your car from professors you can trust with Tom Woods's Liberty Classroom. And if you join through the Liberty Classroom link at scotthorton.org, we'll make a donation to support The Scott Horton Show. Liberty Classroom, the history and economics they didn't teach you. Hey everybody, Scott Horton here. Ever think maybe your group should hire me to give a speech? Well, maybe you should. I've got a few good ones to choose from, including how to end the war on terror, the case against war with Iran, central banking and war, Uncle Sam and the Arab Spring, the ongoing war on civil liberties, and of course, why everything in the world is Woodrow Wilson's fault. But I'm happy to talk about just about anything else you've ever heard me cover on the show as well. So check out youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show for some examples, and email scott at scotthorton.org for more details. Hey y'all, Scott here. First of all, thanks to the show's sponsors and donors who make it possible for me to do this. Secondly, I need more sponsors and more donors if the show is to continue. ScottHorton.org slash donate has all the links to use PayPal, Give.org, Google Wallet, WePay.com, and even Bitcoins to make a donation in any amount. You can also sign up for monthly donations of small and medium-sized amounts through PayPal and Give.org. Again, that's ScottHorton.org slash donate for all the links. To advertise on the site or the show, email me, Scott at ScottHorton.org. And thanks. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's the Scott Horton Show. I'm him. ScottHorton.org is my website. I keep all my interview archives there. More than 2,800 of them now. Going back to 2003. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at slash Scott Horton Show. And our next guest on the show today is the American hero, Daniel Ellsberg, liberator of the Pentagon Papers, uh, subject of the excellent documentary, The Most Dangerous Man in America, author of the book Secrets, a memoir of Vietnam and the Pentagon Papers, which is so important. And you can read chapter one for free online if you just Google around a little bit uh, all about his first day on the job at the Pentagon in a certain position anyway, the day of the Gulf of Tonkin incident and a very first person account of what happened there. Uh, incredible stuff. And then uh, he writes all over the place, including for uh, Truth Dig, uh, where he did a great series on nuclear weapons. And he's an anti-war activist of uh, many descriptions and, and uh, in many very important ways. Courageous whistleblower and defender of courageous whistleblowers, Daniel Ellsberg. Welcome back to the show. Dan, how are you? I'm fine. Thanks for such a warm introduction. Well, I love you. What am I going to do? Play it down? Come on. Right. Okay. Now it's out in the open. Okay, great. Okay, good. So uh, let's talk about the American hero, Bradley Manning. Uh, he sits on, uh, he's halfway through a military trial right now. Um, I don't know if you want to talk uh, at all about, you know, where we are in the court process so far, um, you know, or just about the, Manning uh, in general. Because of the Snowden revelations here, I haven't kept up as I should have and will shortly on the daily transcripts of that trial, so I'm not up on the very latest stuff on that. Have you been following it closely? I admit I've I've basically been keeping track through Nathan Fuller and have not read the transcripts myself either, but although I could say that it seems as though the government's case is not very strong and the, the cross-examination by the defense attorney has been very effective at undermining uh, quite a few of the government's claims and in... Uh, basically setting up the informant, uh, Adrian Lamo, to admit that there was nothing nefarious here. The kid really meant well. There's just no doubt about it. Okay, very good. You know, it's the, uh, the group that I'm associated with on the board, the F Freedom of the Press Foundation, that uh, gathered money, collected money f in order for there to be a transcript. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be, in effect, a secret trial. So the transcripts are there. Now now it's up to me to uh, make use of them. So thanks for that summary. 
Yeah. Um, well, and of course, uh, thanks to uh, Bradley Manning, uh, BradleyManning.org, Nathan Fuller, and, and all those other guys. They're doing great work there, attending the trial. And, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the young woman's name who's done such great work on this. Alexa uh, O'Brien. Alexa, was, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's what I think. was making a transcript earlier, which was all the press had to work with. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, you know, something really bothered me the other day, and it was uh, one of these TV jerks was interviewing Glenn Greenwald, and he was saying, well, now... So would you make the case then that this Snowden guy is uh, somehow different and better than Bradley Manning, who, after all, is considered a terrible villain by so many people, as though that is the conventional wisdom. That's the consensus that everyone agrees, is that Bradley Manning actually is just a no-good Nick. And even if he did mean well, just think of what a sin it was to indiscriminately dump so many documents i mean they don't really have anything that's the best that they have on them i guess but they want us to all just really cheer for the state in its crusade against this young man what's your position on all that dan me you know you don't see many national security whistleblowers who are identified to the public uh most leakers uh, from classified material are anonymous and stay anonymous. So it's really a very small set of people whose names are known at all. And when they stick their heads up, when uh, when they do make themselves known or become known, uh, the media on the whole shows a very, I don't know, puzzling willingness or determination to join the government in uh, deprecating them. You know, and, and helping smear them in many ways and focusing on their personal foibles or their sexual life, uh, whatever. This happened certainly with me, not so much on the sex. Uh, it so happens that Pat Buchanan in the White House reached the conclusion that publicizing what they knew about my sex life would, quote, only increase his numbers. I was a, I was a bachelor at the time. <laughs> so they chose not to, to use any of that. But the um, uh, And they don't seem to have anything on Snowden. But, um, for example, I I noticed, having just seen this, I would say, terrible film, uh, We Steal Secrets by Alex Gibney, rather incomprehensible why he he made such a, what I would call a bad film. But I noticed that uh, no mention was made of, uh, there was ample time given to the charges that were made that Manning and Assange, not before Manning's name was known, but that the source and Assange uh, and WikiLeaks might have blood on their hands or did have blood on their hands. No mention made of the fact that the Pentagon has repeatedly announced that they have no evidence of any blood resulting from these revelations, which is kind of relevant to those charges. Uh, it's You know, the fact is that there was a problematic aspect, I would say. I don't call it a fact. Oh, it's subjective here. But there was a problematic uh, aspect, even in my view, initially, about Manning putting out a lot of material that he hadn't read. That has a bad ring to it. Uh, How can he know whether it's uh, damaging or not? But, you know, three years later, I've seen a lot of benefit come out from the cables that might well not have been, uh, that he might not have read, and that might well not have been published by any one source like the New York Times. For example, the corruption in Tunisia, uh, which led to Arab Spring, really, which led to the downfall of Ben Ali in Tunisia, led to the uh, up- violent uprising against Mubarak. Uh, it's not at all clear that uh, that would have come out if he had limited himself to the relatively small fraction that he could have read. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, uh, no damage whatever. I think we have to... uh, I've changed my opinion on that, in other words. Well, you know... Discriminate between what he did put out, which was only, and I I say this in his terms and mine, only secret. It was not top secret. It was not communications intelligence, to both of which he had access. Almost no one seems to realize that his daily work involved... Uh, communications intelligence, higher than top secret, and top secret material, none of which he put out. So whether he should have or not, he was very discriminating in what he put out, just as I was and just as Snowden is. Right. I, public is, I, I don't know anyone who's made that simple point. Right. Well, you know, he has, in his guilty plea to the facts on yeah. the, the lesser charges, Held it out not that... finally in court when he made his statement. And I believe, right. by the way, that to hear from him, make a statement like that, showing what he had put out and what he had not put out, uh, was one of his reasons 
for making that guilty plea. It was not part of a bargain. It was puzzling to a lot of lawyers why uh, you'd plead guilty to 10 out of 22 charges without any kind of plea bargain, without getting anything back. But I think one of the reasons was to make that point, that he had selected what he had put out and felt that the material was only secret, not even limb disc, no disc, ex disc. Those are distributional uh, restrictions that are put on things. That he presumed that... Uh, at most, it would be embarrassing. It would not hurt security. That judgment seems to have been vindicated after three years, no evidence of damage. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, I think his other reason was to say very clearly he had not been induced to do this by WikiLeaks. The idea of a conspiracy there on the part of WikiLeaks was simply invalid, and he wanted to say that under oath as clearly as he could, mm -hmm. just as I did when I submitted to arrest. Uh, I took public acknowledgement of all the facts that I had done, all the actions that I had done, so that I could say uh, I did this on my own. Uh, I didn't tell anyone uh, who might otherwise be suspected of helping me. They had no part in it. And that didn't relieve them of all suspicion, but it helped, I'm sure. At least that's what I wanted to do. And Snowden has done the same. Snowden has taken advantage of revealing himself to say that his partner, his girlfriend in Hawaii, did not know anything of what he was doing, try to relieve the pressure on her mm -hmm. and on his family. Right. Okay, well, and we're going to get back to him here in a few. Um, but let me ask you this. I've been making the case, and I guess uh, I'm, I'm basically cribbing from uh, Kevin Zeese, the lawyer, on this, um, that, his, that Manning's mistreatment at uh, Quantico, his uh, being held for three years before his court-martial uh, was even begun, and the fact that the president, I mean, this to me is just the, the icing on the cake, even more than the abuse in prison, I think. The president, the secretary of defense, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the three highest ranking people in the military chain of command, all have pronounced Manning guilty. And it seems to me that any honest judge would have to admit that that is a direct order to his judge to convict. And how else is she to possibly interpret that? And so he must be set free, Dan. But then again, I don't know. Am I going, uh, you know, off the reservation here? We you think. Oh, you, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, he, he should be free on both counts, just as my charges were dropped uh, when it was revealed that uh, the Nixon's White House had taken steps against me that were criminal and impeachable, actually, and uh, figured in his impeachment proceedings, and, uh, as the judge put it, offends a sense of justice. Well, of course, Manning's treatment has offended a sense of justice. But when you say must be set free, well, that position has been raised. All of that has been raised. And uh, the court, uh, the judge decided that on the basis of his being held under conditions that um, the U.N. rapporteur for torture regarded as at least cruel, inhumane uh, treatment and possibly torture. Uh, as a result of that, they would take 112 days off of his sentence, which might be a life sentence. So I suppose you know, he gets three months off uh, uh, when he's in terminal conditions of some kind. But meanwhile, uh, the treatment of him and the pronouncements by everybody here, like uh, I'm talking about Snowden now, have convinced Snowden, and I think very realistically, that if he wanted to be able to tell the public what he had done uh, and why he had done it and what his motives were and what the patterns of criminality were in the material that he was re releasing, it had to be outside the United States. Uh, otherwise, he would be in perhaps the same cell that Bradley Manning was, and that's a military cell. The uh, NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, permits military custody indefinitely of an American citizen who's a civilian. And Noden could very well find himself at Quantico, uh, naked perhaps, like uh, Bradley was for a while, and have no ability to be really incommunicado, as Bradley has been for three years, with the single exception of being allowed to make a statement when he pled guilty. To twenty, uh, to twenty charges, or what was it, ten charges? Eh? And uh, that's the only chance he had to speak out. So I think Snowden has learned from that example. When it comes to being pronounced guilty, the head of the 
uh, Intelligence Committee here, Senator Dianne Feinstein, has said this is an act of treason, indicating that she has probably never read the definition of treason yeah. in uh, in the Constitution, in her Constitution, and our Constitution, which uh, involves the element of adhering to an enemy of the United States, which no one is claiming that uh, um, Snowden has done or that Manning has done. He's not going to be charged with treason, as a matter of fact. But the word can be used as a smear, and of course the effect of that on a potential jury is very significant. Of course, the word is being used very commonly uh, about him and Manning, and me for that matter, by Cheney and others that should expect it from. Right. Okay, and now one more thing before we get too far into the Snowden thing, uh, back to Manning here. Um, yeah. And this is something that we've discussed in the past, but I think it's so important to get on the record, especially here in the middle of his military court-martial and everything. And that was the final straw that made him do this, uh, as he explained to the informant Adrian Lamo, was that he had been ordered not just to look at pieces of paper or watch videos and review war crimes committed by others. He had been ordered to participate in them. He had been ordered to help the Iraqi government imprison, uh, capture, abduct people for the crime of writing op-ed pieces. Wondering uh, specifically, where did the money go about uh, corruption in uh, and downtown people Baghdad? That he knew would be tortured by the people we were turning them over to. Right. So not only was the action of turning them over to torturers illegal, criminal, but so was the order uh, to not to investigate it further, which is what he was asking for, uh, not to stop the process, but to continue to get more people to hand over more suspects. As he put it, summed it up. I was I was actively participating in something I was totally against. And the challenge he makes to every person, really, on the planet, and every American citizen, everybody in the armed services or the government, but all of us, really, do we feel that what is happening, being done in our name and within our tax dollars, uh, is something that is legal, moral, ethical, something that we should be doing, prudent? Or are you one of those like me? who finds it reckless, immoral, and uh, in many cases criminal. The question then is, what do you do about it? And Manning put his life on the line. Uh, I think it was appropriate. The stakes justified that kind of personal risk, and the same is true of Snowden. Mm. These stakes, we're coming back to him, I guess, but I'm saying the stakes, as they were for me, uh, were worth a person's life. Right. I mean, this is the thing, and we've talked about this for years before anybody ever heard of Manning or Snowden. Obviously, you've been talking about this since before I was born, but uh, you've been talking about this with me since 2004 or five, something like that. And that is that when we're talking about these imperial wars of occupation, uh, of aggressive war and invasion in other people's countries, that the soldiers have a duty to liberate this information and publish it and make sure that the, the Post or the Times or Greenwald or somebody or Julian Assange or somebody can get their hands on because the mission is wrong. What they're doing is wrong. The empire the is wrong. Orders are expected to give the benefit of the doubt to an order that it's legal, that they get, and they certainly do that. And that's understandable in a military context in particular, and really pretty much everybody in government. But a lot of orders that have come down in my lifetime and in the last 10 years and, and before that are blatantly illegal, blatantly unconstitutional. The orders to torture, to hand over people for torture, to fail to investigate that are blatantly illegal. And everybody obeyed that except Bradley Manning that we know of. Uh, if, if, if somebody else has refused any of those things, actually, uh, there have been actually, I would say, one or two people who have exposed it. So let me take that back. Joe Darby, of course, who had to go under a witness protection uh, system for a while here, having exposed the torture at Abu Ghraib. Sam Provence, uh, likewise, was uh, demoted and threatened with court-martial for doing that. So there have been a few people who spoke out. Uh, General uh, Taguba, actually, his career was ended when he asserted that what we were doing was blatantly illegal, and that ended his career. So uh, the, the punishment is clear enough, but the stakes actually make that worthwhile. Uh, what are you here on earth for? What is your life for, and what is it worth? For what will you risk 
and sacrifice. And really, if people ask themselves that, they can think, they should be able to think of a number of things. But the, uh, but giving up their career in order to save the Constitution or to save tens, hundreds of thousands of people from death in wrongful wars or needless wars would seem to be, it should be one of those things. It doesn't seem, people just don't ask themselves the question. I think if more people ask the question uh, posed by Manning or Snowden of what they ought to do in this situation, they wouldn't all do it, but uh, some of them would. Right. I mean, I think of it about, you know, in terms of, and I don't know what the prison sentence really is, but would you rather have a couple of years patrolling in Afghanistan, uh, helping the Delta Force do night raids, maybe getting your legs blown off by a landmine when you got no business there in the first place, or do a few years in the brig for doing the right thing and telling the people the truth, you know? Which is more well, courageous? It was, was in a base uh, that I just saw in the movie that was described as perhaps the safest in Iraq. In, uh, Iraq. It was far from any, there had been no enemy action, whatever. So he wasn't exactly risking his limbs there, and he's not risking just a few years, of course. He's risking his life. Yeah, but you're right, though. Uh, most people do not have information that poses them with that kind of risk, and they don't take any risk at all. That's, that seems to be the normal, ordinary thing. I think that's a human characteristic and one reason that we're on our way, in my belief, to extinction uh, with the uh, threat of nuclear winter, nuclear war still with us, and the climate changes that are confronting us and the population. And I think uh, a species that has so much capability for destruction, for damage, and so constrained an ability to care about people outside our own group, ourselves, our family, our team, our organization, or our nation. Uh, it's very clear, by the way, that uh, Manning, in very particularly, was concerned about the non-Americans who were being harmed by all this. And that's, in a way, what uh, people like Cheney and others uh, mean when they say treason, to, to care at all about what we're doing to other people is, in their minds, uh, a form of treason. And unfortunately, too many people share that, but some people have awakened. And unless more wake up from that, uh, to that kind of concern, uh, we've had it. The species is going to go and take an awful lot of other species with it. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, it's in the dark times that, uh, you know, there's always you find the silver lining, too. Right. For example, you've got this guy, Snowden, who certainly must have heard your call at some point. You know, what I mean, he's well, he not ignorant of he, Dan uh, Ellsberg, this guy. He said he admired uh, Ellsberg and Manning. There you go. I'm so. very glad to be in that company. But that sounded as though, uh, unlike Manning, he was probably too young to have heard my name at all. Uh, and Assange, who was who was born the week I was uh, eluding the FBI, actually, uh, back in 1971, though he heard about it from his mother, his anti-war mother. But I was glad to hear that uh, probably uh, the example had, had not deterred him because both of us, of course, were put on trial for facing a life sentence, Manning and I. Manning is very likely to get it. Uh, I lucked out in many ways in that the crimes against me came out in time to spare me that life sentence. But uh, Snowden was not deterred from that. And frankly, that was something of a surprise to me. Uh, I was just reading a book here, the, This Machine Killed Secrets by Andy Greenberg, which mentioned at the end of one chapter, well, there, given this digital era, there will be more Bradley Mannings. And having just read that, I, I have to admit, I said to myself, yeah, don't hold your breath. Uh, when people see what's happened to Manning, uh, people aren't going to rush to join him. And it didn't take long for Snowden to come along and, uh, and uh, expose himself to exactly the same risk as Manning. That gives me hope, more hope than I've had for a long time, that there will be others who show that kind of civil courage on which I keep saying, and it may sound like hyperbole, but in my mind it's not. Well, you know, Civil Dan, courage on which our species' survival depends. 
Well, you got to be pleased by some of these polls have, you know, give or take. I know they come back with different numbers, but give or take half the country says that this Snowden guy obviously is siding with them against their government, right? Yes, they don't I believe would, for a minute I, this I hokum have, that their government is I them. I am encouraged by that. And by the way, just minutes before this call, I, here's what's easy to do now these days. I just signed a digital petition that Barbara Lee has put out for repealing the authorization for the use of military force The uh, uh, that was signed uh, without, you know, any, but just by reflex, by everyone but her. Uh, Barbara Lee of Oakland back in uh, 2001, 2001, yeah. Mm. And uh, she wants to repeal that since it's been used, as she says, to support torture, kidnapping, drone assassination, other invasions and whatnot ever since. She says it's time to cut that back. So there's a, a CradoAction.com, I think it is, petition, or Barbara Lee, uh, to support her bill to repeal that. But your point on the, uh, in general, on the polls, there is an encouraging side to that. And I'll tell you something kind of funny in a way. People have drawn attention to the fact that whereas uh, the overall polling on this has not changed uh, on whether you believe in the government having all the data on the telephone calls of everyone, and I would say that includes the content as well, though that hasn't been admitted yet. Uh, what do you think about that? The polls are about the same as they were back when that was first revealed in 2005 by the New York Times. But the position, the relative position of Democrats and Republicans has reversed almost in terms of the numbers, the relative proportion. Back in 2005, um, most Democrats, most Democrats opposed that under Bush. And now, uh, and most Republicans supported it. Now, most Republicans oppose this right now, and most Democrats support it. So they reverse. Well, that looks on the first, and it's like simple partisan hypocrisy. But there's another way to see it. Uh, in a way, they're both right. The, Republican, the Republicans correctly distrust those powers in the hands of a president that isn't of their own party. And they're right. And the Democrats don't trust these parts. They can see room for abuse when it's a, re a president of the other party, of the Republicans. Both right. Their only mistake is they're willing to trust it if it's in the hands of a president of their own party. Right. There they're wrong. And it's a naivete that uh, doesn't do them credit uh, but maybe they can wake up from that delusion. Right. Well, you know, I think that's still the margin, right? That's the swing voters in the middle. There's still a lot of people who hate this no matter who's in charge. That's true. Yes, that is true. That's well, it. and I'm just having a good day today, I guess. I, I, I'm more optimistic than usual. I'm sounding like it anyway. Yeah. Well, there. I hate to tell you, but there are also those people who trust that whoever's in charge. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry uh, to tell you that, but... Uh, no, actually, I am hopeful at the reaction to this, uh, but uh, we'll see how long it lasts. The administration, I'm sure, is, uh, is counting on its going away. Uh, even David, uh, not David, Frank Rich, was predicting that uh, this was the, an interest of the moment, but it'll be over by August. Well, it's up to us to see, in a way, whether we keep this one burning or not. Uh, mm -hmm. The... Um, uh, there is, uh, I think there's going to be a lot more revelations by Snowden, and that'll keep it going, I think, Thank, given that he's not in the country. Right. I mean, according to Greenwald, he's got a dozen more stories coming, minimum. So. That's right. I, my strong guess is that what we're going to learn is that the recording of data, the storing of data, is not at all limited to, quote, metadata or to foreigners uh, with PRISM or anything like that. I think they're what I would call collecting, that is, recording, listening, recording and storing everything, everything. What we're saying right now, of course, but, for example, William Benny, formerly of NSA for over 30 years, says the million square foot Store a place they're building in Barktail, Utah, NSA is building, 
uh, is he's try he's made some real calculations as to what that's meant to store. And he said if all they were storing uh, was uh, text, for example, or metadata, uh, a small room would suffice for virtually the whole world with the storage capability they have now. Mm-hmm. He said when you want 100,000 square feet, 10% of that million square feet they're doing, he said that's clearly for video and audio, and that means everything. And when they say, when the president says, we're not listening to your calls, he speaks with forked tongue there because what he means is uh, we're not listening live, obviously. Uh, it would take the whole population to be doing that. Um, uh, he's, uh, But he's not saying we're not storing it for later listening at our leisure with yeah. our feet up in front of the fire, <laughs> pouring over whatever we want to right. of what you have. And um, uh, I think when... Uh, uh, Keith Alexander and uh, Hayden and these other people involved assure us that um, they're not collecting. Oh, who was it? It was um, uh, Clapper. Clapper said, we're not collecting uh, information on millions of Americans, which at first sounds like a simple lie in the in the face of uh, what Snowden has revealed there, they are collecting data on hundreds of millions of Americans. But he explained.